Good evening, and welcome to the first Amplifying Melanated Voices, a conversation with Black designers. I'm Joni Thomas, the, assist, the host and the assistant chair of the Fashion Design Department at FITM. This evening, our amazing panel of designers will be discussing their careers in the apparel industry, unique challenges they've experienced, and the future they desire. So before we get started, I'd like to share how this evening will flow. We will start out with a brief introduction of each guest panelist and work our way to one-on-one -on -one conversations that focus on their journey in fashion. From there, the entire panel will explore the present day state of our country and will share their thoughts, observations, and hope for our future. Thank you all for joining this conversation. Our first guest is Thomas T.J. Walker. T.J. is the co-founder and creative director of the first preeminent urban brand, Cross Colors, Clothing Without Prejudice. He is an esteemed instructor at FITM also a co-founder of Black Design Collective. Our next guest is Octavius Terry. Octavius is an alumnus of FITM with degrees in both fashion and advanced studies. He is also the CEO and co-founder of the luxury menswear brand, Groom. Next, I'd like to introduce Devere Hickman. Devere is a recent alumnus of FITM with degrees in both fashion design and advanced theater costume design. He is also the first recipient of the Black Design Collective Scholarship. Our final guest is Ileana Guzman. Ily is currently a FITM student. She is also the managing editor a FITM student publication called Mode Magazine. I'd like to give a warm welcome to all of our guests. Welcome to the conversation, TJ. Hello there. Hi, TJ. Um, Let's start out with exploring the impact of cross colors. What was the motivating factor to create this brand and who influenced you? Well, that's a, that's a big one, Joni. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, just to give uh, people a little background on cross colors, I mean, cross colors started in the 90s, actually 1989. And our intent, my partner and I, Carl Jones, our intent was to actually create a brand that actually, um, actually for a market that was basically underserved that we thought at the time. And that was a market of, of people of color. Uh, because at the time there weren't any brands really that actually highlighted us as, uh, as people able to purchase, but also uh, a brand that actually gave us, um, you know, reflected our identity and our culture as well. So that was the thing that sparked the, the brand itself, but also a piece of kente fabric was really the thing that really started it as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was a really a, a part that actually sparked us as well to actually move towards making uh, the product. Uh, and as far as inspiration for, for Cross Colors, I think um, as we put it with uh, Carl and myself, uh, actually the culture inspired us mm -hmm. and it actually came from us. Uh, as far as how we felt about, you know, uh, just being who we are, but also how we lived and actually uh, basically it came from the streets because we were influenced directly by the street and the street culture actually to, uh, to do Cross Colors. Yes, I, I remember Cross Colors back in the day. It was my favorite brand. Um, how did it affect the apparel industry, uh, Cross Colors, and who, did you influence? Well, the effect on the, uh, the industry was um, phenomenal because 
at the time, um, there weren't any brands that really uh, addressed the culture per se. And also as far as a brand that was colorful, uh, we came out with colors uh, and this was something that was not being done at the t time. And the things that were being done were basically khakis and navies and blacks and grays and things like that. So we had these bright colors along with size uh, clothing that was very oversized. Uh, again, coming from the street in terms of how people were wearing their, their product. And when we actually went to our first magic show in 1990, um, it, was, uh, it was interesting to see the floor then because we were basically the only black company there uh, that we can recall for the most part. Um, and that actually changed years later because a lot of uh, companies of color actually appeared after that, which is amazing. But we came onto the um, came into the magic show, and we were very we were terrified. We were scared too because we uh, actually were very short of cash at that point because we spent all that money developing the product. Sure. But to our amazement, uh, and it actually sold really well. We got millions of dollars in orders that day at the magic show, uh, which was then another challenge to produce that product once we got it. So. Yes, that that's fantastic and. And I know you inspired Rock Aware, uh, Baby Fat. I mean, we can we can go on and on. Um, yeah, and I think that goes back to the part of you know the floor changing, the, yes. the the look of the Magic Show because it opened the door. That brand Cross Colors opened the door for a lot of other brands to follow suit and come out, which was wonderful. And uh, still to this day, a lot of the people that actually got their start in the industry people of color actually came through Cross Colors, uh, the brand, and now they're still working in the industry, uh, a lot of them. Too. That's wonderful. And, and two, to add to the inspiration part two, uh, just individuals uh, that wore the product back in the day and even that are wearing it now since we launched the brand, they tell a story constantly about how they were influenced by the brand and how the brand gave them a sense of empowerment and inspired them. And these stories are never ending. And we hear them quite often, even on our, our IG and Facebook, uh, people send in stories to tell us about how much they were influenced by Cross Colors. I love it. Bravo, bravo. Um, you are obviously a believer in higher education with a BFA in commercial design, an MFA in graphic design, and you're presently pursuing a PhD in education and global design influence on modern culture, it's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, but as an instructor, um, what gives you the most joy? Um, you know, what gives me the most joy uh, are the students. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell everyone uh, all the time because uh, I'm definitely usually the, uh, quite recently, the oldest one in the room. But I usually, I love being around the young minds and the, the culture as well, because they keep me, they basically keep me up to date <laughs> pretty yeah. much in terms yeah. of what's going on uh, in the industry, but also in the culture and then in just in the community and also trying to keep me up to date on technology, which oh, moves yes. so fast, yes. you know, so, which is unlike the days before, but I really am inspired by the students. You know, they, they are what holds me to teaching and also to always uh, seeking to learn more. Excellent. I feel the same way as an instructor. And uh, one of the other things that I really love too about uh, being an instructor is actually seeing them develop a design language, their own, that's yeah. authentic. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty powerful. Um, let's dive into your Black Design Collective. What is the mission of this impressive group of apparel professionals? Well, Black Design Collective, it, it actually really mirrors cross colors in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but myself um, and uh, Ruth Carter, Angela Dean, and Kevin Hall, we all came together and decided to form a nonprofit organization that actually uh, serves as a place for creatives of any age to come to and actually to engage with, to help them with uh, learning how the industry works. And it's not just for fashion designers, although uh, most of us are very heavily into the fashion world, it's for creatives. 
So we in, invite everyone to come to actually take a look at our website, which is blackdesigncollective.com to just check it out and see what we actually do there. And a big part of our platform, again, are the students and mentoring as well. And we wanna just help people navigate through the industry as much as possible because we, we wanna help them avoid a lot of the stumbling blocks that we face coming through the industry and already in the challenges here today, but also try to even, you know, um, uh, encase it with technology and uh, industry experiences as well from others that actually are knowledgeable uh, about the industry. Yes. And also, um, you guys also offer a scholarship to students. Mm -hmm. um, what are the qualities that a student has to possess in order to be awarded this scholarship? It, we, um, we, we struggled with this, uh, you know, this point in terms of what the qualifications are, because we like to give scholarships to everyone. Um, but our scholarship, scholarships are actually based on the funding that we actually receive from our sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, we have a limited amount, but we all we won't do as much as we can possibly to actually help the students. Um, with our scholarships and Devere Hickman, who is actually one of the guests today, is our first recipient of the scholarship, which was uh, $10,000 that were awarded to him to actually for his continued education. And he will tell you uh, about that later on, I'm sure in the discussion about what he, it actually helped him with, sure. with even that funds. But we, uh, the qualifications are stringent in terms of the GPA has to be at a certain level. Uh, the work as well, we get a portfolio presentation also. And there has to be some type of um, a written information too that actually says why you want the scholarship. Uh, and there's some other details as well that actually go along with that. But those are the main ones that we actually focus on for the selection uh, of the student. Uh, thank you so much. It's been an honor, TJ. Hold tight Welcome. for the group discussion. All right. And we'll be talking soon. Yes. Welcome to the conversation, Octavius. Hello. <laughs> Octavius, your company groom yes. produces ready to wear originals that are not only worn by iconic personalities day to day, but also on the red carpet, worn by likes of Lena Waithe, uh, Queer Eyes, Karamo Brown, and many other celebrities from the world of music, entertainment, and sports. What inspired you to carve out that specific space for luxury menswear? You know, it's interesting just hearing uh, TJ speak earlier because uh, I was one of those cross-colored kids when I uh, was in college, actually. And uh, it's interesting, there's, some, there's a lot of parallel in there, and I've been fortunate enough to some of the people that he's named in it and in the Black Design Collective actually mentored me to kind of where I'm at today. So, you know, it started out, you know, I was born and raised in Atlanta, uh, in the inner city of Atlanta. And uh, I'm actually the first person to graduate from college from either side of my family. Uh, and as an African-American male growing up in the South, um, I, my first degree was from Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. It was uh, extremely important for my parents just to have me go to college because of what they thought were going to be a lot of disadvantage and I had to be very exceptional. But while I was in Atlanta and growing up, and it's kind of like what TJ said, like part of Atlanta is being, you know, being in the streets and being from the streets. And what I did realize early on um, growing up, because I ended up going and working and being a vice president for a bank. And what I realized is as an African-American male, as soon as um, not only um, African-American men, but men, when they put on a suit, they felt like superheroes. And I had always been told, you know, first impressions are everything. So I, I, I said, you know, and like TJ said, I wanted to carve out a space where, um, you know, because I am from music, I am from ath athletics, you know, I'm a former uh, Olympic hopeful. I've been on a couple of United States teams, but I still realized that when I put on a suit, my presence, when I walked in, there was, there was something magical about that. And I wanted to make all men feel like superheroes and especially uh, men of color who were already had a lot of disadvantages, but I wanted to give them the kind of armor that we could be used to. So a lot of my suits, I call it alternative red carpet. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of celebrities, like I worked with Ray J for his wedding, but they come to me because they want to be able to wear a suit and feel good, but they also want to, like TJ, 
there's a mix that they want to put with it. So like with my suits, that, like what I have on now, uh, sometimes guys want to put on like a pair of Jordans, you know, they want to get married uh, and then right after keep it on because they still feel like superheroes, but there's still an element of, um, you know, they still want to feel comfortable. They still have, you know, an edge to them. And I wanted to be that person uh, to, to kind of do that and didn't know. And like TJ said earlier, I was scared when I did it. You know, I am a, a, a proud alumni of, of uh, FIDM. And when I went to school there, I was scared because everything I was learning, I was going to try to apply to an industry um, that was already 100 years ahead of me. And so, um, so I did it and didn't know what was going to happen. But like I said, like you said, some of the names and, you know, to have, I had Terrell McCraney win an, win an Oscar in one of my tuxedos and I was up against, you know, Dior and everybody. But when he saw me and he saw the suit, he's like, this is what I'm wearing. And that gave me the confirmation that I needed. Like TJ said earlier, that was my million dollar moment where I was like, okay, I can be a player in this space. I love it. I love it. So who influenced your creativity? Ooh, uh, that's that, you know, I have, uh, I'm a hybrid of a lot of different things. I, I call myself kind of a cat. Like I said, I've been an Olympic hopeful. I've been a musician. Uh, I worked as a vice president, but I would say the one thread that I always had was be exceptional in everything that I did, you know, yeah. because of, you know, potential disadvantages that I wanted to make my superpowers. And so my influences, I wouldn't say came from certain people, but it came from everything I was doing, you know, from the athleticism uh, to working in a bank and still having to, uh, like have those first impressions, but then get, kind of having that stage presence, wanting to be a musician. And like you, you know, you rattled off some people that I worked with, they come from all areas because I've realized that all the things that I've done kind of funnel into my design aesthetic that I had to learn, you know, that I learned on the way and, you know, and it kind of fits. And, and like TJ said, it's, all, it's always a scary moment because you don't know if people will gravitate to uh, who you are, but I think it's a, an extension of me. Uh, it is an extension of seeing my father who never got a chance to wear a suit because he was a truck driver. Uh, mm -hmm. But I wanted to him to be presentable and look like a superhero. So I even made a, uh, if you saw in one of my collections that actually Karamo Brown was in the first um, collection, I have a pair of overall silk tuxedo, uh, a tuxedo <laughs> bib that's underneath a, a, a blazer that was, that sold really, really well. So uh, it's an influence of, my background per se. So ha were you able to even um, design something for your father? No, and, and you know, the interesting thing about it was, um, I think I, I participated, I was a Bob Mackey um, scholarship winner at FITM and I presented my collection and in my story, I told the story of, um, he was a truck driver. He did get a chance to see me go out to California and, and, and do my dream, but you know, unfortunately, um, he is what made me feel like I had to live every day like it like it's no tomorrow. Yeah, um, he was the reason why I, I walked away from corporate America because uh, he had an unfortunate accident, a catastrophic accident that put him in a coma uh, for like five years. So during that time I was at FITM during those years, like that was my motivation. It's like, I, I can't worry about um, what people don't think that I can do because, you know, being a an African-American male jumping into the tailoring world, you know, you're you know, I wanted to be, you know, everything comparable to Tom Ford and that kind of thing. And so I had all these people saying, are you sure you want to do it? You know, you sure you want to walk? I was like, I just saw my father go through this accident. And so I can't wait. So that was what pushed me. Excellent. Uh, what are some of the challenges you face in creating the space? <sighs> just like we were talking about, it was... Yeah. Uh, you know, coming in and, and, and being a player in the game of like men suiting and tailoring, um, there was about 100 years of catch up for me. So uh, it was a lot of uh, learning on the fly. It was a lot of uh, um, figuring out mistakes. And now I realize that there are no mistakes. They're just learning opportunities. Yeah. So I had to go through that. But I, I, I knew that I had to jump in it. But um, the obstacles were, um, you know, the people putting their insecurities on me. You know, and I realized that later on. And once I got past that, those were the same people that feel like they contributed to the success. <laughs> uh, but they did in a way, they yeah. motivated me, but yeah. they were, they, uh, there were more people scared, scared for me than I was scared for myself. Yes, yes, yes. And um, thank goodness you didn't give up. Right. <laughs>
what is the one bit of advice you would have for our future creatives looking to take the same road? You know, it's, it's so funny and I, and I have to do my shameless plug, you know, shout out to, you know, I was, I'm an alumni of Georgia Tech and FITM, but I'm also now the uh, fashion program chair for the art institutes across the country. And um, I am too, like you, you and TJ, where I'm in a space now that FITM has given me all the tools that I needed to make myself, you know, confident in taking on this position and having a lot of students under me. And the one thing they know, and I hope they've all tuned in as well, is that there are kind of three things that I kind of abide by. And one of them is uh, just jump. And, you know, I think Steve Harvey said it, jump and, and build, your, build your wings on the way down. Um, so you just have to go. Um, the second part of this is don't make a lot of announcements. Thread the needle is what I tell them. You know, there's a lot of people say, you know, I want to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. But when you put proof to concept, no matter how hard it is, you will have people, if you build it, they will come. So you'll have people that will come in and help. I will yeah. say that TJ named uh, Kevin Hall, who's also a FITM alum. I was his intern while I was at school, and I wanted to learn everything from him. And uh, I was able to go in and work for him as an intern my second quarter there. And I learned so much from him. So shout out to Kevin Hall. And uh, I watched, and I just, I just learned so much from him. And then the third thing is, like I said, me coming from Atlanta, uh, make your turn your disadvantages into your superpowers because those are the things that make you different um, but you have to you, you have to own that superpower it's not a disadvantage it, it's what makes you who you are and it becomes the thing that people gravitate to you and whatever products you sell whether it's fashion or whatever you have to stay authentic 100 percent authentic thank you so much for sharing with the audience. I'll see you again during the group discussion. You guys, thank you. Welcome to the conversation, Devere. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. We're so excited that you're here. <laughs> um, you began your FITM journey with an impressive theater and dance background under your belt. How did that journey in performance art motivate your decision to attend FITM? And was there a white space that you wanted to feel? Well, growing up as a dancer and then actually being able to land a career with it was amazing in itself. So during that whole time of me touring with the amazing companies I perform with and the productions I've been in, I always knew that I was going to be involved somehow in that world, whether it was like teaching, whether it was like directing or whether it was like coming up with my own concepts for shows. But I also like found myself going into the costume shop, going in there and seeing how things were made, like all of my amazing costumes I had on and how they made them and what was on the inside and where they came from. And I was just like, bells and whistles of like feathers and bugle beads and rhinestones and ruffles. And I was just like so wowed by it all the time. So I would always get into the costume shop and get to know the ladies and the men who made my costumes. And, and it was just like such an interesting thing for me. And then after I was done with that, with my um, amazing career that I was fortunate to have in dance and musical theater, I attended a couple of the FITM debut shows and I was like, wow. <laughs> this is where it's at. And then they had a musical theater um, program, you know, with the costumes that they did when they hired all the dancers, local LA dancers to perform. And I, my eyes were just wide open the whole time. And I didn't even know that was out there. So after the second debut show, I was like, I'm doing this. And I got information and just stayed up all night working on my portfolio to send in to get into the costume program. And I had to do the fashion program first which is two years, and then I got into the costume program, so. Wonderful. Uh, so you've created beautiful theater costumes for a debut. What's the story behind them? And describe your process of creating. Wow. So with theater costume, you have to really have an, a knack for being a storyteller. A lot of my friends and family always say that whenever I tell stories, I'm so animated and like, they love to hear stories from me because I'm always telling like every single detail of each character in the story. And then there's like the punchline. So with a costume designer, that is so much fun. You can actually 
put them in clothes that will tell the story and that you as a viewer in the audience, whether it's live or whether it's watching a, a film, that you could, you could tell which character is which and remember them just by their costume. You don't even have to remember their name. You might remember that costume that so-and-so had on. Oh yeah, that character because she had on this amazing leg of mutton sleeve with all these jewels with a locket that had a story in it as well. Inside that locket was a picture of her loved one or a picture of her parent, which is something personal to the character that they can bring out in the production later. So it's just being able to like go into each character and, and get out those details, which is what I did for the debut for Turin Do, for the ancient Chinese dynasty, had all of these secrets inside, whether it was a hairpin in her in her um in her coiffed bun that she was going to kill the prince with or whether it was a peacock that represented on getting the attention of the loved one that was embroidered onto his shawl so it was just really really fun to do that and get into each character and tell the story it's all in the details all in the uh, details i'm going to move on but i have a question for you later thank okay. you there looking forward to seeing your your path the path <laughs> that you will carve out in um, theater costume. Yes, okay. great, great. I will see you later. Yes. Welcome to the conversation, Ellie. Hi, how are you? Great, great. You look beautiful. Thank you. Uh, you are nearly, you're nearly finished with your fashion design um, degree. Um, congratulations. Uh, what and or who inspired you to pursue your fashion degree? Fashion has, fashion has always really been my whole life. Um, I have the most supportive family too, so it was never something out of the question. I remember when I was in fifth grade, we had a science fair and I decided that I would chart what the most popular shoe was in my class and have my best friends walk up and down the classroom with the shoes. And then they told me that wasn't science, but I disagree. So it's really just been my whole life. Wonderful. Um, speaking of design, I know you have a dress on the form. What's your design language? And what's the, what's the, what, what's the story behind the dress? Um, so the story behind this dress specifically is um, I made this dress for the movement. Uh, I use the colors red, black, yellow, and there's a lot more green on the back. Um, so recently the Black Lives Matter movement has sparked up again and better and bigger than before, or at least in recent times since I've been alive. And I feel like as an artist and as a designer, it is our responsibility to make art and fashion that is a reflection of our times. So I made this dress and I wrote as many names as I could find of people who were killed due to wow. either white supremacy or just killed by the police, all full of color and it goes to the dress. And I know you can't really see because I wrote the name small, but it just, it was a very impactful dress for me to make. And I, I really thought it was important for it to be done by every artist, like every artist and every designer should be making art that reflects what's going on in our current society. Very powerful, very powerful. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, you are the managing editor of the 15th edition of The Moat Magazine. What do you think makes this edition different than previous Moat publications? Honestly, in the creation of this magazine, we set our bar very high with the, with the title Astonish Me. And a lot of people were like, how are you gonna reach that bar? How are you gonna astonish people with a magazine that they didn't do before? And honestly, it's because my amazing team and I knew that in order for people to really feel astonished, they have to feel included. They have to feel like they're a part of it. They have to feel connected to it. So we worked as hard as possible in this magazine to cover as many communities as possible. And I don't just mean ethnic communities. I also mean we included the LGBTQ community and we talked about sustainability and we did a cultural shoot. Lots of good stuff in there. I'm not gonna give too much away, but we hope that you are astonished when you see this. 
It's excellent. I, I was uh, privy to see it before. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> bravo, bravo to your entire team. Um, thank you. Um, I only see greatness for you, Illy, in the future. Stay focused and keep shining. We're gonna yes, move. We're gonna move on. So at this moment, I'd like to welcome back all of our guests for group discussion. Everybody's in. Wonderful. So let's take this time to explore the present day topics and issue we as a community of creatives are dealing with concerning our nation's reckoning with race, especially during this global pandemic. Uh, we're seeing a huge movement today in fashion labels being called out for lack of diversity and even for using diversity in campaigns and advertisement, but not standing with the Black Lives Matter movement. What is your idea on how several of these companies can not only be activists, but also welcome a change from them? I'll start with uh, TJ. All right. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, and uh, the answer, <laughs> and to answer that one, it would take a lot longer, you know, than right. we have right. here to actually do that. Um, but I'll just say that, you know, um, and, and I'm going to reference Cross Colors. Um, I think that when we started that brand, our intention was to actually, first off, we wanted to make clothing, we wanted to make clothing for us, uh, but we also wanted to say something uh, with the brand. And so with that, we actually, we intentionally actually had slogans that actually reflect our thoughts and what we felt, you know, about uh, political issues, social issues, and even, uh, you know, and cultural issues as well, uh, to a certain degree. We put those on our, in our messaging, you know, and what's interesting, and, and, and I think those things that we did, and actually not think, I know, those things that we did back in the 90s, um, with our relaunch of the brand, um, we actually have those exact same messages. We didn't change anything with them, and they're selling today. They're even selling more today than they did wow. when we first launched the brand, just sure. restarted the brand uh, sure. recently, about four years ago. And we had our highest sales in the recent months, uh, believe it or not. Um, and, and that's just to say that I think people are actually coming to terms and actually coming to identify that, you know, there are issues out there and they've been out there. You know, those are the same issues we addressed in the 90s and they're still here today and we're addressing them again and people are coming up to the, to the forefront to actually deal with that. I think, you know, a lot of companies uh, in the past, they, they've been silent and, uh, and they have not addressed the issues. But I just want to say now that I see a lot of companies coming to the forefront and really making an effort to actually, you know, take accountability for things. Yeah. And I just say things, but take accountability for, you know, things that have happened and they want to see how they can actually help. And I think that uh, how people can help and how they can actually lend a positive note to this is to ask the question. They need to just ask, what can they do, you know, to help? And I think that would be the start, you know, to have the conversation because we tend not to, you know, a lot, we haven't had it, but now people are put out in the front with technology, with videos, with, yes. you know, social media, these things you're exposed immediately in terms of your actions. So I just think that people need to just realize and just sit back and, 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 and be responsible. And I can see that. Yes. You know, uh, Ili mentioned Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, they are, they have a, the light is shining on them bright right now because of a lot of things that they're doing. But, uh, and I just want to say that when I look at who's standing in the line or on the forefront also, this time around, it's a lot different from past years. And yes. I thought that. And, yes. I it. Uh, and I think that's the way you solve it. And that's the way you go forward you know, in any situation, unity, and everyone coming together to actually go forward, you know, in this, this process. So 
Um, sorry, I took too long with that question. Well, no, that's, that's great. I, I think that um, your answer is absolutely right. And I also think that that's why I'm so hopeful Me for too. change Me because too. of the everyone who is joining this fight. So, right. yes, right. thank you, TJ. Uh, Ileana, um, how can our white allies help to facilitate this change? And are we having those conversations? Our white allies, actually every ally, white or any other, can help facilitate change by not only holding themselves, but their loved ones and the people around them accountable for the things that they do and that they say, being aware of their unconscious biases or their prejudices that, prejudices that they may hold and not being afraid to say, I need to change this, I need to be a part of this. Um, also just like regular things like signing petitions, putting forth the effort to make change because honestly, the black community, like we have been wanting change for a long time. And yeah. we need allies to also want change just as bad as we do. And that's gonna start when they look to themselves and think, well, how am I contributing to this? Because just sitting quietly and acting like, well, this isn't my problem. It is your problem. It's humanity's problem. And we all need to be a part of putting that foot forward because obviously the black community has been trying and we've been doing and we've been fighting and we've been fighting for years. So we need this allyship to really be the stamp on the envelope and, and making change and making permanent change. Yes, yes, thank you for that. Uh, Octavius. Yes. Have you experienced racism in the industry, whether blatant or microaggressive? And also, if you could share um, how, share with the, the youth how they can deal with it. Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of what I, I piggybacked on, you know, so, when I started making these suits, I was always, I already felt like I was a hundred years behind the game as far as being a tailor and, and trying to catch up to the catch up game. And I already had my own insecurities. So um, one of the things, some of the people that took me on at the beginning were, you know, uh, celebrity, African-American celebrities, right? Uh, but what I wanted to do was, um, you know, I would say, like you said, it wasn't, uh, I think it wasn't like in my face racism. But I knew it was like, you know, that's the guy that makes suits just for black guys and that kind of thing. So that encouraged me to do what I needed to do to really uh, push what I had to do. And, I, and, and shout out to Mark Ballas from Dancing with the Stars and, and Derek Huff. I actually did Mark Ballas's wedding. Wow. And that was really what put me in the game. And it solidified me, you know, my, you know, internally, you know, I can be you know, I don't have to be, you know, a, an African-American, just an African-American designer, they would call me, I'm, I mean, a tailor, I'm a tailor, and my work should speak for itself. So I, I thought that uh, at the beginning, the racism came from, you know, people recognizing my brand as one that could stand beside, you know, all the other brands that were, were making suits, you know. And with that to say, I wanted to piggyback on what your first question with TJ was for. Yeah. For example, one of the things that I think that can fix this because of like some of the stuff that I was facing, I say, you know, I hope that somebody hears this like from the bigger brands, but all the, I don't think that the, the, um, it starts with trying to get people to work for the brands like Gucci and all these people who've had these uh, blatant racism things that happen on the runway. What I think they need to do or get people like Ileana and Divert and myself and reach back to the designers that are that are already a hundred years behind, and not bring them in, but be, become partners with them. You know, make a collaboration like Gucci, and you know, collaborate collaborate with um, you know the people of color like us, or the designers, and say, hey, we see you. Like like Ileana said, they see us, and and they're putting um, they're they're putting themselves in the game and bringing us on and making that a focal point. We want to go back to people who are really trying to get there. Let's partner with them. Let us have something in partnership with these people who um, are trying their hardest when they're already behind. So that's what I wanted to say. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's great. That's great. And that's an excellent point you're bringing up. Um, 
So, uh, can I add something to what they were saying? Absolutely, Javier. So, what I, was, what I was, I've been thinking about this question ever since I received it. And it's just that I want to make sure that our allies are there, but also that they aren't there because they have to, you know. I yeah. want them to be there because they want to. Right. And when you talk about these designers and, and higher institutions and stuff being inclusive with um, the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's brown people as well, then I want them to ensure us that it's because they want to, not yeah. just to appease us just for a certain amount of time and then yes. think about it, yeah. and not just hire one or two percent of black and brown people just to clear the waters. I want them to hire the black and brown people because A, they are talented and they are passionate and they will help move their companies further in, um, in the direction that we all as a whole need to move. So I was speaking to my friends and I was like, I don't want any of your, any of your um, appeasement or any of your, your fairness because you feel like you have to just to look good or just to get funding. I want you to do it because you want to. That's different. Yes, because we add value also. You know, we add value to the business. Um, I think I'm going to go. We have uh, viewers' questions, and um, anyone can jump in. Um, I have a, a, a viewer that says, "What advice? What advice would you give a high school student with no current fashion experience in the?" in the fashion industry? Anybody? Um, may I hop in? Yes. Um, so one thing our school, FITM does, one thing FITM does is we have uh, the fashion club and you can go to fashionclub.com and you can start a fashion club at your school and FITM will give you all of the resources to launch this club. I started the one at my school before I graduated. And also if you're the president of the club, you get a scholarship to go to FITM. And it's kind of like a good way to start and also meet other people who are in your school who have the same passion as you, just in case like you have no one to talk about how much you love, I don't know, runway shows with. And it's, it's like, it's finding your community and working towards going to a good school. Excellent. Um, another question I have, uh, what advice do you have for a young black entrepreneur who wants to be involved in streetwear, but are facing challenges with getting into the industry. TJ, you want to take that? Well, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that the fashion industry in general is a challenge, <laughs> you know, overall. It's really hard for anyone, of color or not of color. It's, uh, it's a hard industry to kind of pierce. But I think uh, what I would suggest to uh, a young person who wants to actually get into things or learn more about something that they, they think they need to know more about, you should actually um, use your uh, mobile device, your phone, because you're constantly on it. Get on that and whoever you want to get in touch with, reach out to them. Whoever you think you need to get in touch with, they have something called DM. You know, I'm learning these things because my students <laughs> Me too. So I think that, you know, you shouldn't be afraid. And that's, that's what I'm saying. You shouldn't be afraid. Whatever you want to do, whatever you think you need to know, reach out for it. Um, and I think one thing you could do too is you could reach out to Black Design Collective because we do have a platform for students. And we have a platform for people that are starting out. We have mentorship programs as well. So you can also reach out to us also. But Another thing you could do too is just simply go to YouTube and type in what you're looking for. I tell my students that every day. You type in what you're looking for and you will find something. Okay, maybe it doesn't give you all the information, but it'll give you something so you can get a start or jump start you in a direction. So I have another question. How often do you face being the only black person, person of color in the room? And how do you handle those situations? That's a good question. You want to take it, TJ Octavius? Yeah, you know, I, I yeah. what I what I'd say is, you know, I, I learned early on. Like I said, if anybody's gone to Atlanta, it's like the mecca of you know being African American, and I love it here, and I love being back here. Um, I always felt like, again, what I told told the students earlier, 
let your what you would think your disadvantages are be your superpowers you know so there is power in being the only person of color when you walk into a room so yeah. you have to hold your head up yeah. it is all about first impressions and, and so that's why that was one of the reasons why I started doing suits because I wanted, you know, I wanted to give people that first armor so they could walk in, you know. Um, I'm excited when I walk in. I'm like, okay, now I'm excited because I want to be able to represent in a way that I will, if people thought certain things about people of color, I want to be that person, that martyr that's going to change their minds right now. So um, I, I, I actually, you know, bring that on and I, I want that more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't say I'm the, the full representative, but I will say that I am ready to go in with my armor to fight for people of color and to either change their minds or enforce the positive things that they learn. So I would say don't be insecure. Let that be like being a person of color, especially now, is a superpower. Yeah. Very much yeah. So. I agree. I also felt like taking it back to when I was a performer they had a certain, I'm not sure if they do it anymore because I don't perform anymore, <laughs> but they had um, an area in the auditions process that they said that they were specifically looking for a black male dancer. Mm -hmm. And I had a problem of being too light because from Ooh. the third balcony or from the, even the second balcony, I look like um, I'm a Caucasian person on stage. So if they need to hire that, I don't want to say token um, black dancer for the show to get, you know, to appease the masses or whatever, just for having that black person in the show, then they're not going to hire my skin color. So I always had to show up and show out even more, you know, just being my skin color that I am, even though I am African-American, I don't look like I'm African-American to someone in role double Z. So it's just, okay. when you are a person of color and you walk into a room and you're the only person of color, you have that feeling of, of overachieving and proving yourself that you can you know do it just as good as someone next to you or even better so yes 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 um i'm going to go back to one of my questions um just about every magazine and online publication has recently released a list of black designers to support and invest in how can we keep this momentum going um I'll take the first round of that one. Okay. Uh, I think the, uh, the way we keep this going is to ourselves buy black. And I'm not just saying buy black on a specific day. I'm just saying buy black. Uh, because we are talented. We have plenty of products out there. And I think it's not a problem for us to actually do a little research and actually dive in and find those products that are out there that are available. And I'm yeah. pretty sure you almost find almost any product that you're looking for. You just need to actually do some research. Um, and there are some websites, and I think it's called blackbusiness.com, maybe uh, something like that, that actually has a list of black businesses, not just fashion oriented businesses, but also uh, all types of businesses. Uh, anything from your attorneys to your accountants to all those individuals you should look to see if you could surround yourselves with people of color, you know, not because it's trendy to do, which is now, you know, but let's just make it a staple item. Let's make it the core of our existence, to make it the core of our, you know, daily, you know, what we're doing and how we navigate. Because when we invest in another black company, we're investing in ourselves, you know, and it's just simple as that. It's, yeah. not, a, it's not a hard thing to figure out. Yeah. Other communities do that. Yes. Now, we just need to learn to do that as well, yes. you know, to build our own cities or to build them back, you know, yes. uh, but we need to actually do that ourselves and invest in ourselves. That way, I, would, I was going to say, and I want to add to that because I think since the beginning of time and, and the Burke can probably, I was in the entertainment industry as well. Uh, the world would always pit colored uh, people of color against each other. You know, it, like the models that I work with, I work with primarily all uh, men of color when I do my shows just because, because they're not used to that. They're like, they go into a room, they're going to have out of 12 models that do a runway show, they have three black models. And so they feel like they have to be mean to each other because there's only going to be that one spot, right? So to add to TJ's point, not only would they, should they actually um, add to uh, what, what, what he, you know, to buy black, but I say, 
let's build each other and not be comp so competitive with each other and become partners with each other, right? Because we can learn so much from each other and we can combine forces to be a bigger, to be a bigger force if we can just let what the history used to be of like competing against each other and become one and lift each other up. And whatever I can do for anybody, I shouldn't be afraid and hold it to myself and give it back. Yes, because there's enough, right? There's yeah. enough for us all. Yes. Illy or Divert, would you like to add to anything? Yes, I, I strongly agree with Octavius and it's what TJ was saying as well, is that we all have our talents and we all have it right here and just seeking other companies. I won't say any names, but just other companies that are predominantly um, white we don't have to seek that from them for validation because we we have it and we we have always had it so it's just building our own building our own labels building our own design houses building building our own um theaters just like how we used to in the past you know just to really create collectively as as black designers and brown designers so we can build our own empire and also be inclusive of anyone else that wants to follow that follow that path with us as well so it's just that's what we need to do and not seek validation from the other companies yes just because we we, we attend as humans to seek outside of of what's inside of us first before seeing what's inside of us and then sharing that to the world and i think that's most important that we need to to do yeah it's not about the labels it's about who was wearing the label right 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 um, another question from um, the audience. Um, how do you balance staying authentic and true to yourself, believing in yourself, and taking design advice from mentors? Well, I'd like to like interject on that just really fast, seeing yeah. that my mentors at the Black Design Collective, every day I'm wowed. If I'm like watching a show and it's like, oh, Angela Dean, design this for me or like TJ with cross colors and seeing like celebrities on TV, like whether it's Wendy Williams or, or Oprah or anyone who's like has like cross colors on, it's like I feel so proud to say that I was the first recipient of the Black Design Collective Scholarship of the $10,000, which helped me immensely. You yeah. know, Kevin Hall, it's just having those mentors, you know, like it's really special. So, so really seek out who you want to take that mentorship from and write them letters, show them your design, show them your passions of what you want to do and you never know what's, what, what's in store for you. So. Ellie, do you have anything to add to this one? Yes, ma'am. I actually had the privilege to be able to see vintage cross colors um, that Mr. Walker had brought me and my colleagues, or my yeah. colleagues and I, excuse me, um, and he spoke with us. And I have to say that that was one of the most inspiring days of my life. Like it felt so good to see so much success from someone who looks like my loved ones and myself, like just to see my community, like what we can achieve and know that it's just the tip on the iceberg. And, I, and touching on the staying true to yourself, Staying true to yourself is the easiest thing to do when you love every piece of you and every yes. piece. Because you're the only you you can be. People can look like you, but they don't think like you. Right. People can sound like you, but they don't know your heart. You're the only you in this entire world. And once you come to terms with that and how amazing you are, it's just so easy to not only remember and uplift yourself, but uplift others as well. Illy, you are such an old soul. <laughs> you really are. Exactly. You're fantastic. The same thing. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, got to la I've got to laugh a little bit because TJ, Illy, Illy called, she, you brought me in some cross color vintage pieces. That just told me how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> I me too. Think about you. Think about me. Think about me. <laughs> I know. I'm like, so oh, I just remember wearing my first cross colors and now it's vintage. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm old now. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Illy. <laughs> okay, at this moment, um, I'm going to give, <laughs> give each one of you an opportunity to tell everyone uh, what projects you're working on uh, at the moment and or what your future plans are. So uh, we'll start with TJ. 
Okay, so um, actually, like I mentioned before, uh, just to make it clear, uh, we relaunched the Cross Colors brand about four and a half years ago. And like I said, it's doing really well. And you can check it out at crosscolors.com. And you can see, uh, you can actually get a, a, a tip of the uh, history related to the brand. We have a newsletter you can sign up for. And also uh, you can see the product. And like I said before, we were making a lot of the product we did back in the 90s. And now starting some new uh, product and we actually have a new collaboration that we're working on that I can't disclose right now, but okay. it'll be coming out within in a month. And I think everybody's gonna be really overwhelmed and excited about it because we are. And also the Black Design Collective. Um, that's blackdesigncollective.com. Go check it out because we actually highlight and want to, and that's exactly what DeVere got his scholarship from, but we also do mentorship programs and also help with business strategies for companies also. Excellent. And what we, and, and that's basically what we have going on right now, you know. So. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Octavius. Oh yeah, just very quickly, I'm still here in Atlanta uh, as a, the program chair, but we, uh, Groom Official has now become my namesake brand, which is Octavius Marcion, we're a full lifestyle brand. So I just uh, secured a collaboration with Native Ken out of New York. Uh, we have a, a, an eyewear collection coming out. They've allowed me to design it over the last year and I just saw it, but it comes out this fall along with the collection that I just showed uh, with the school. So in the fall, I have the namesake brand coming out along with my collaboration and uh, I'm working with a lot of football players. Shout out to uh, Jody Fortson of the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm doing all of his suiting for the NFL season. And uh, I'm going to continue the partnerships because like I said, I'm trying to uh, be a full lifestyle brand now. Fantastic. Dever, Dever. I am basically just sketching. I'm doing a lot of stuff here at home in quarantine. I have been doing products that projects that I'd never thought I would tackle before, like rhinestoning a full mannequin head, <laughs> which takes so long. And it's like takes up a lot of time, but it's you know, that's that's all I can do right now for the moment. All of my fitum costumes um, for the debut are still at school and storage, which I wish I had them here so I can like add that extra rhinestone, <laughs> add more feathers or something. I'm like, oh, all this time I could be like making them even more fabulous. So I do miss my costumes that are there at school, but just making sure that I'm staying really um, mind body yoga inside and making sure that inside is calm because of everything outside being so um, yes. and crazy to make yeah. sure that I come out on the other side even stronger than I was when I went in, so. Yes, thank you. Ileana? So like we mentioned before, I'm finishing up my degree in fashion design. Um, so soon I'll be putting together a final collection for class, but also for myself because I love it. And hopefully after I graduate, I can be put on as a designer in a great company that matches my design aesthetic and just makes me happy and take care of my family. Excellent, great. So in closing, I'd like to uh, thank our distinguished guest panelists for their honest and insightful contributions to the first Amplifying Melanated Voices conversation. TJ Walker, Octavius Terry, Devere Hickman, and Ileana Guzman, thank you. I'd like to also give a big shout out of thanks and appreciation to FITM for seeing the value in this conversation and giving voice to our experiences. And thank you to you all for joining this evening. I'm looking forward to more inclusive conversations. I'll leave you with this last thought. Diversity and inclusion isn't just good for society, it's also good for business. It's time.